CCC AR4 conclusion on attribution. I'm sure you've all seen the statement from the um, AR4. Most of the observed increase in global average temperatures since the mid 20th century is very likely due to observed increase in anthropogenic greenhouse gas concentrations. And one survey of or assessment of actively publishing climate experts concluded that 97% of actively publishing climate experts agree with this statement. I suspect that the agreement with this statement might be smaller in this room. That would be an interesting topic for discussion. Okay, what I'm going to do in this talk is I don't have any dramatic new scientific results to show you, but rather I'm going to audit the IPCC's attribution statement. And auditing focuses on accountability. I'm going to look at the treatment of scientific uncertainties, the traceability of the assessment, and the logic of their attribution argument. Now, when I first saw versions of this um, diagram, that the, the early results were being published, I was very much struck by the agreement between the simulations with natural and anthropogenic forcing and the observed global temperature record. And to me, the strong agreement between the observations and model simulations provided confidence that the observations of surface temperature had to be correct, the external forcing data had to be correct, the climate models had to be correct and agree with each other, and the sensitivity of the climate models to increasing CO2 had to be correct. If any one of these things um, was wrong, we wouldn't have got such an agreement. And that's how I interpreted this when I saw this. And it was this agreement between the observed and the simulations that really gave plausibility to all, all of these things with regards to the capabilities of the model and our understanding of the forces. Well, if, if you look at the AR4 simulations without the anomaly adjustment, you get quite a different picture. In fact, and, and this is a figure from uh, Lenny Smith, if you actually look at the global average temperature, not the anomalies, you see the there's a range of, of 3 to 3.5 three degrees centigrade. And if I would have seen this, I would not quite have been quite as impressed by this agreement. Now, if we're going to talk about uncertainties, you have to talk about, especially with models and observations, that there's an amazing number of uncertainties that you have to consider. And it would take more than the time of this talk to, to list the uncertainties that are associated with elements of the attribution argument, but there's the location of the uncertainty, like um, whether we're a particular parameterization in the model, there's the, the nature of uncertainty, whether it's statistical uncertainty or whether we're out in the realm of ignorance, there's different types of uncertainty, epistemic uncertainty, which is associated with limited knowledge and limited information, and then there's the ontic or aleatory uncertainty, which is fundamentally irreducible uncertainty associated, in the case of the climate system, um, the nonlinear chaotic variability. And if you start listing all the possible uncertainties that are associated with the, this endeavor of trying to attribute climate change, I mean, it's a, a very big list. In this talk, I'm going to focus on three sources of uncertainty. The first is external forcing associated with solar and aerosols, climate sensitivity, and then the assessment of natural and internal variability. Now, in terms of solar forcing, and I, I'm sure that others will be discussing this in, in more detail later in the year, but if you look at, um, in terms of what was used in the third assessment and the fourth assessment, it's the green, blue, and red curves that were used. And, and you see um, substantial variability and a generally of interest between 1900 and 1940, there was an increasing trend. Now, our current best understanding is that there was no secular increase um, during this period as represented by the purple curve. However, the climate model simulations for both the third and the fourth assessment used the green, um, red, and blue. And the uncertainty ranges, you know, in, in at many times, you know, exceed one watt per meter square. And for reference, we're talking about 20th century CO2 forcing is 1.7 watts per meter square. The IPCC has classified the uncertainty associated with solar forcing as low. Now, if we go to aerosol forcing, the 
the IPCC AR4 concluded that over the 20th century, aerosol forcing likely ranges between minus 1.7 and minus 0.1 watt per meter squared. There again, we see the magic 1.7, which if it was 1.7, it would have exactly canceled out the, the CO2 warming. Now, at the same time as the um, AR4 assessment was underway, Morgan et al. conducted an expert elicitation on, a, on 24 aerosol experts, including the IPCC authors on the section. And they came up with a substantially larger range, minus 2.1 to minus 0.25 watts per meter squared, with uncertainty as high as 7 watts per meter squared. I mean, this is a huge uncertainty. And, and, and this relates to what the question that Steve Schwartz asked related to the, the, the last talk about in terms of the forcing data. I mean, how do, with all these different sensitivities and using different forcing data, how do the models all agree with the observations? Okay, well, there's a, an, an element, you know, inverse modeling. A lot of these models were tuned to the 20th century observations. They had the option of selecting which solar forcing data or which aerosol data they wanted uh, to choose. And so did they do this blindly? Well, the detailed documentation of how they calibrated and why they selected certain uh, forcing data sets just simply isn't out there in most cases, to my knowledge. So there's an element of circular reasoning here. Now let's take a look at climate sensitivity. Um, again, the IPCC has put likely bounds around 2 degrees and 4.5 degrees centigrade. And this figure from um, the IPCC um, fourth assessment shows a number of different estimates of climate sensitivity. Most of these are done using low order and energy balance models and um, observations ranged over, you know, over moving over parameter space. And, and if you look at this, you see, well, half of these estimates have peaks that are lower than the two degree bound. Okay, so what the heck is going on here? How did they come up with this two to 4.5 degrees? Well, there, there's some clues given in chapter 10, okay, and then they gave these three figures, and they gave one that we just saw, constrained by past transient temperature evolution, constrained by climatology, unweighted distributions. Okay, let, let's take a look at each of these a little bit more carefully and see what goes into this. They use this diagram, the one that I first showed, oops, the one that I first showed you, to infer that figure 1B, most of the results confirm that climate sensitivity is very likely below 1.5 degrees centigrade. Here's the 1.5 degrees centigrade. One of the peaks is actually below 1.5 centigrade, and there's lots of uh, things going on below 1.5 centigrade. How did they infer very likely below, very unlikely below 1.5 degrees centigrade? They use this for evidence. I don't know how you can make that inference from this. Let's take a look at these. Oops, constrained by climatology and unweighted distribution. Well, constrained by climatology, this is actually simulations from the um, climateprediction.net, which is using a simple version of the HAD atmosphere, Hadley Atmospheric Science Model. And, oh, geez, and, and these are three different distributions. Oh, geez, I really messed up. Okay. These are three you know, different distributions that three different co-authors have come up with. Now, if you look down here, you, you see these four curves are associated, again, with the Hadley atmospheric model. So, so we're getting a lot of sensitivity estimates coming from one single model, which is atmosphere only. The most interesting one is the dotted line, which is the individual AR4 coupled models. Okay, we see this dotted one. But it's hard to believe that they, I mean, if this is an airbrush PDF, I mean, it's not a histogram. It's hard to believe that things actually look like this PDF. You can see where the 2 to 4.5 is coming from. But again, if you're looking at bounds, it's the action that's going on here at these boundaries that's of interest. And I think this is airbrushed out by the form of their PDFs. So, again, I'm still left wondering how they got this 2 to 4.5 degrees centigrade. I assume it's coming from this kind of a diagram, but it seems um, the reasoning isn't quite there by my book. Now, if we're trying to explain the warming in the latter half of the 
20th century. It seems to me we also have to explain the warming in the early part of the uh, 20th century, say from um, 1910 to um, 1940, and also this period where the temperature was very flat from 1940 to 1970. So the, the conventional thinking had been that this warming was associated with solar, you know, with an increase, a secular increase in solar forcing and to some extent volcanic variability. But we see from the recent solar reconstructions that there, that there is no secular increase in the solar forcing. So we don't really have a convincing explanation for this. The explanation for this hiatus in the warming was aerosol forcing in the era before we had the Clean Air Act. Okay. But if you compare what's going on in the Northern Hemisphere with the Southern Hemisphere, we see that the cooling was more, <coughs> was more substantial in the Southern Hemisphere, although people interpret, if I can do this without flipping this, that, that this is really a, a, an increasing trend with just a single drop, and, and this, this is flat, you know, but this is like, you know, I don't view the aerosol argument as a convincing argument for explaining um, this feature. So the question arises is what is the role of natural internal variability on the multi decadal time scales in explaining these features? And, and the two features that are most widely discussed are the Atlantic multi decadal oscillation and the Pacific decadal oscillation. Now, if you look at the Pacific decadal oscillation, you see it dipping into the cool phase for this period that we're interested in between 1940 and 1970, in particular. And we also see upticks during this period in both the AMO index and the PDO, with the PDO staying solidly warm until um, started flickering starting in about 1999. So what is the role? of this in um, attribution of the 20th century climate variability and can the PDO or something like the PDO explain the flat feature in the temperature from 1940 to 1970? Well, there have been two recent papers published discussing this um, issue, mostly motivated by the, the recent uh, lagging in, in the warming over the past decade or so. Neil et al. Um, said, we will see global warming go through hiatus periods in the future. However, these periods would likely last only a decade or so and warming would then resume. And Santa was more specific. Our results show that temperature records of at least 17 years in length are required for identifying human effects on global mean troposphere temperature. And the implication of these two papers is, is that the 30-year cool period between the 1940s and 1970s cannot be explained by natural internal variability. Okay, so um, well, let's take a look at what went into the Neil and the Santer papers. They used the simulations from the AR4, and this is a spectral density plot okay, of the power of the various periods. So what you see is that in the yellow period, labeled too high, is that the power in the models is higher than the observations period of 8 to 17 years. That's presumably where Sanders' 17 years come from. But if you look at um, the period between 40 and 80 years, you see the climate models are too low. And note that this is a log log plot, so when these are too low, we're talking about, you know, factor of 2, factor of pi, um, and then even in this case, the order of magnitude too high. Now, paper discussing this is in press, and I've already gotten a, a 